Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us here at the Mechanics Institute at 57 Post Street, San Francisco. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events, and we're really, really pleased to welcome you to our program, Real Impact, the New Economics of Social Change. And we're very pleased to welcome our two guest speakers, author and investor Morgan Simon, in conversation with activist and political fundraiser Kath Delaney of the Madeira Group. So tonight we're going to talk about how investment and activism can be partners, how finance and social justice go hand in hand, and how our capital, our money, can be used for social good and with a return. These are some of the things that we're going to be talking about this evening. But first, I'd like to find out how many of you are new to the Mechanics Institute. Who's never been here before? Any newcomers? OK, everyone knows about us. So out there, uh, if you're watching, if you've never been to the Mechanics Institute, please come on Wednesday at noon and take the free tour of our library, our International Chess Club, and find out about our incredible history. Um, we were founded in 1854 and continue to be one of the most vital cultural institutions in the West Coast. We have a beautiful library, and as I mentioned, the Chess Club has ongoing events, we have author programs, and many things are happening under one roof. So please come to the tour and become part of our ever-expanding cultural family here. So I'd like to introduce our moderator for the evening. Cass Delaney is the founder of the Madeira Group, a social impact agency based in the Bay Area. Her agency is dedicated to growing her clients' social mission and donor base across sectors. Kath is a prolific fundraiser for social justice, human rights, climate change and adaptation, conservation, and the environment. Kath is a longtime political activist and fundraiser and served on Hillary Clinton's national finance and policy teams leading up to and during the 2016 campaign. Also, Kath and I have a, have a long history together. We first met each other in Boston, uh, taking leadership for the arts training uh, at the Boston Actors Institute. And then onward, we became uh, partners as we were both producing for Earth Day in New York City in 1990. So I'm just <laughs> thrilled to welcome you to the first, for the first time here at Mechanics Institute. It's been a long time. Welcome to our program, Kath Delaney and Morgan Simon. Thank you so much, Laura Shepard. Thank you so much for inviting us to the uh, Mechanics Institute. I'm really excited to be here with Morgan tonight. Um, I read her book in the last week, and she's a very, very smart person. And for someone like myself, who's been raising money for as long as I have, um, in the nonprofit sector, in the social justice community, to read a book that has so much insight and depth um, into how finance works, how difficult it is to raise money for issues and organizations and leaders that are doing frontline work. Um, I think that Morgan said many things in the book that I don't know if I would have the courage to say, and you said them. So let me tell you a little bit about Morgan, and then we're going to turn it over to hear a little bit more about Morgan's work. Um, Morgan Simon is a widely recognized leader in impact investment who builds bridges between finance and social justice. Over the past 17 years, she has influenced over $150 billion in capital. Morgan Simon. Simon currently co-leads the Candide Group. Did I say that correctly? Correct. Thank you. Um, Simon currently co-leads the Candide Group, which supports two clients, including members of the Pritzker family, which is a very well-known Bay Area family, Chicago family, who does great things in the world, on behalf of their foundation, the Libra Foundation. She's the co-founder and chair 
of the nonprofit Transform Finance, which I think we're going to get into a little bit tonight. Previously, Simon Morgan served as the founding CEO of Tonic, a global network of impact investors, as the founding executive director of the Responsible Endowments Coalition. She's worked for the United Nations in Honduras in corporate reform with Forest Ethics and in domestic microfinance with the Women's Initiatives for Self-Employment. She currently serves on the boards of the Restaurant Opportunity Center, the Working World, and Care Entre Enterprises. As a graduate of Swarthmore, Simon serves as an adjunct professor at Millbury College Graduate School, and she lives in the Bay Area. So please give me a warm welcome, Morgan Simon. And for Kath as well. Thank you for being here. So I also want to say that the book is so tightly written, and I'm saying that in the best sense, that it is really filled not only with Morgan's life experience, but also case studies and insight about where we are and a path moving forward. And in part of the book, um, you talked a little bit about your, your youth, your young, when you were a younger activist. And um, I could relate to that. I've been a young activist. I started my activism in high school as well and went to Africa in my early 20s. And I think we have a similar shared experience where um, that early activism and, and traveling out of the U.S. and also working in specific communities in the U.S. really opened my, my, my eyes and my life and my heart um, to how most people around the world live, which is very different than how most of us in the Bay Area live. So there was a, a really wonderful story you shared about regarding um, your early work on, on aid work. If you could maybe tell us a little bit about your early work. Sure. So I, I um, grew up in Los Angeles and did a lot of work with immigrant communities in downtown LA. And this, I think, was, was mostly um, an incredibly transformative experience for me, right? Separate from any good that I might have done for others, but really all work at the end circles back to ourselves and our own personal development, especially at that age. And I was really um, blessed that a number of mostly Mexican-American families um, that were inviting me to their homes um, on the weekends for the parties, for the quinceaneras, and really learned the difference between solidarity and charity in that time. And charity is the idea of seeing people as other, and solidarity being about the fact that when someone is trying to hurt your family and friends, you will do absolutely anything that you can to defend them. And that was the way that I felt about these families who had taken me in. And it meant that when I saw the mother come home from her job where as an undocumented uh, immigrant to the US um, of just getting grossly mistreated or having seven people in a studio apartment, you know, trying to find the space and peace to sleep between those working hours, um, that I became extremely passionate about how do we create conditions where everyone has the opportunity to thrive. And with that, and I think learning a bit more of an international perspective, was, was really excited by the idea of development. Um, that was mostly what I studied. And I had the opportunity to spend some time in Sierra Leone and West Africa a year after the war had ended. So very intense time in the country. And I believe the story that you're referring to that I write about in the book was that I was um, coming back from the countryside where typically people were only eating a meal a day. Um, but it was extremely tough time in the country. And one of the things, going back to the concept of solidarity, that as an a American who was used to eating three hearty meals a day, it was pretty tough uh, to try to adjust to that calendar of the you know, 3 p.m. meal. Um, but I was really trying to do my best to only like occasionally sneak Weetabix into my bedroom. Um, and I was passing through this town to pick up some provisions, and I saw this can of tuna, and I was really intrigued. I'd not been eating well for months. I was like, oh, I could have tuna. Like, this would be Protein. so exciting. And um, I go to talk to the woman of, you know, how much is the can, and, and then when I pick it up, I see that it's stamped World Food Program, not for sale, gift of the government of Japan. And I asked her, like, where did you get this? And you know, it says do not sell, and you know, I'm, I'm 20, I'm relatively naive. And um, she kind of looks at me and 
and it's pretty clear when she speaks, um, she speaks Creole, she's from Bo, I th think she, she spoke Mende, she spoke a couple languages fluently, um, but English was not, you know, her first language, nor could she read the can. And she sort of gives me this look of, are you going to buy the thing or not, right? Like, let me get on with my day. And it's about one U.S. dollar, um, and for the price of that can, you could buy from the next lady over eight heaping plates of rice with, ironically, fish, because that's what they eat locally, right? So you could get greens and fish and rice. And it was this incredibly rational economic decision, right, that this woman had gotten this food aid, right? She'd been donated the, ostensibly this can of tuna, and she immediately turned around and said, how do I maximize the economic value of this to get eight plates for my children? And I thought that was a great decision on her part, and I bought the can, and I was very happy. I didn't eat the can. Um, I kept it on my mantelpiece uh, for the rest of my college career as this reminder um, of just the broken chain of international development. Because what I was calculating in that, in that moment and, and for the months after, the fact that probably 60 times as much economic benefit had gone from the fishermen in Japan to the government officials to someone working at the FAO in Rome to whoever transported that can of tuna to whoever handed it out on site, right? Most of the economic value of that transaction was not with a beneficiary, right? So you couldn't actually look her in the eye, hand her the can and say, the reason this is coming to you is for you to eat, right? That mm -hmm. that was probably the least element of that can of tuna. Um, and it made me really recognize how broken that system was um, and that I needed to do something completely different. And I, I had no idea at that point what that was going to be. Um, but I think a lot of my history, and I think for a lot of activists, it's this constant struggle of how can I be most effective given the place and space that I'm in? Um, what's the right role? What do we need to do to think differently than what's been done in the past? Hmm. Well, I'm... I think we're all grateful that you have that experience um, because your work has really navigated um, very complex systems. Um, the finance, the economic system, you talk about in your book, and I think all of us here living in the Bay Area, um, the relationship um, around, excuse me, social entrepreneurs. <clears throat> and social impact. Could you talk a little bit about how that's different? How that's different than aid work? Um, <coughs> so it's, it's different in a lot of ways. Um, and I think in general, if we say more specifically, people who are trying to solve social problems through for-profit businesses, right, as opposed to nonprofits, what makes that different? And that often, sometimes people use the term social entrepreneurship to mean both nonprofits and for-profits, but let's say specifically in the for-profit context, I think it connects back to the larger challenge around philanthropy, you know, even beyond nonprofits, right? So last year, there was $390 billion donated to charities in the U.S. And that's, that's a phenomenal number. But when you compare that to the $196 trillion that's circulating in the global economy every day, you're locked into this David and Goliath fight of philanthropy is trying to clean up the messes that the economy is creating. Um, but it's never going to win, right? It's so under-resourced in comparison. And it kind of makes you wonder, well, rather than having all this economic activity that messes things up for people and makes the world more unequal and, and unsustainable, and then we have to use philanthropy to try to clean it up, what if you just got it right in the first place, right? Like, what if you designed economic systems um, to serve people um, and to serve the planet? And you could certainly make profit, right? And if we think of profit as kind of a reflection of people's desire to live good lives, right? However they choose to use those profits to, to live whatever they consider to be a good life, we can still generate that for people. Um, and we could also perhaps lessen the need um, for the hoarding of wealth um, if we didn't leave people feeling so economically and, and emotionally insecure. And um, <clears throat> the second part of that is, <clears throat> would you say, I have a tickle up in here from a cough drop. Can you pour this for you? Um, <clears throat> if impact investment um, is a better tool than traditional philanthropy and giving, and maybe for the audience, if you could 
unpack it a little bit and just talk about how they're different vehicles. And in your experience, can they work together? Are you seeing them move more closely together to have better effects um, in the community that mm -hmm. you're serving? <clears throat> So let's start with some definitions. Um, that impact investment, right, is the art of investing with the intention of manifesting your social and environmental values in the process, right? So philanthropy, I give the money away. Impact investing, I might be trying to achieve similar goals to my philanthropy, um, but I'm going to receive some type of return, right? So in the same way that um, teachers who have pension funds, right, that that money needs to be invested to ensure people can retire or 401k, <laughs> or even your bank account, right? That um, we think a lot about the votes that we make with our dollars as consumers, right? Anytime that you buy organic milk or cage-free eggs, right? You are making a moral choice in that moment. And similarly, you are every time that you put money in the bank, right? But we don't think of it that way. We don't really think about where does our money spend the night and what's the opportunity for us to have that money be doing something more socially responsible on the way. So impact investment is the idea that you can align a lot more of your resources with your value set. Um, and from that perspective, I think of it, fantastic. Um, I think of it as a compliment to philanthropy, that it's not about saying either or, um, but it's that we need both, right? Um, and I would say in general, I think philanthropy is exceptionally good at two things. It's great at disaster relief, that there are times where there's just not going to be an economy functioning in a way that's going to allow the normal transport of goods and services. You're certainly seeing this right now in the Puerto Rican context, and that there's just the need to get water and food to people. Right, that, that from a humanitarian perspective, it's our obligation, whatever that costs. And then secondly, I think philanthropy is great for advocacy, right? So recognizing that it might be in a policy context or social norms, right, on, on issues like racial justice, where you need to have a massive cultural shift on an issue that's going to take a long time um, and doesn't necessarily have a clear economic upside, a clear business model to that. Now, there's a lot of stuff in between, like economic development, that often gets seeded philanthropically, but ultimately is only going to succeed if investment dollars step in and elevate it, right? And it goes back to if I've got $390 billion on one side and $196 trillion on the other, right? It's very difficult to think I'm going to achieve those goals. So that's why philanthropy and impact investment, it's really about working in partnership. And that's part of why you're seeing, for instance, foundations, right, legally are required to give away just 5% of their money a year. And the other 95% can be invested in absolutely anything, right? And that means that it can often be invested in things that are completely counter to the values of the institution. Um, so just one more story. Um, that back in, I believe, 2001, um, the LA Times published a fantastic series of investigative articles about the Gates Foundation, looking at um, where they were investing and then where they were donating, right? So in Nigeria, they were giving something like $218 million, you know, quite a lot of money annually, towards some of the health problems that were happening in the region, things like asthma that were caused largely by the oil companies, and at the same time, the Gates Foundation had 423 million invested in those same oil companies, right? So when you're investing twice as much money in the problem as you're funding the solution, don't be surprised when you lose, right? Um, if you you know keep going two steps back, one step forward, right? Don't be surprised if you don't arrive. Um, and the Gates Foundation has changed their tune. They've become one of the leaders in impact investment. And I think that's one of the transitions you've seen amongst the foundation sector over time, that it's just become less and less socially acceptable to say, well, I only spend 5% of my time or, or my money on my actual mission, right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm a partner of a firm. If I told my business partner, well, I'd like to actually spend 95% of my day hiking in the Berkeley Hills and I'm going to spend 5% of my time actually doing the mission of our firm, like, I think I'd get fired, right? Um, and it should be the same way for foundations um, in terms of saying they're only going to dedicate 5% of their resources towards their stated mission. Who else in society gets away with that, right? It's a really interesting conundrum. It is. It was a, a, a moment for me. I was um, at a conference where Melinda and Bill Gates were speaking about their work in Africa, and they were talking about the malaria delivery system. Mm -hmm. And Melinda said something on this panel that 
was a life changer for me. She said, you know, we realized after a year that it wasn't working because we were giving medication to people, to women and children who were hungry. They couldn't digest the medication or their bodies couldn't absorb the medication. So they realized that they had to address poverty. They had to figure out how do you feed people before you give the medicine. But it was so simple and it was so profound for me that it really made, my, made me think about my work in a different way. And you also brought up Puerto Rico. And I was thinking about our talk tonight, and I don't know if people saw in the New York Times, I think it was a few days ago, but there was a, 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 a family business out of Montana that just secured the $300 million gig to build the electrical infrastructure in Puerto Rico. And, and I mean, it's going through congressional channels now, but I, I don't know the gentleman and his son's politics or anything like that. If you just put it aside and look at it from a, a quick investment, he said, we were the first people to get, peop to get electricians and power, wor power line workers. It's actually what my brother does. We've done it for 30 years in upstate New York, which is a really hard job. But they, had the, they were able to deploy workers into Puerto Rico faster than anybody else. And you know, everybody- Versus hiring Puerto Ricans who are already well, there, which perhaps would have been another option, but yeah. It, well, I think they're actually doing some of that, but it's also imperfect is, is, is my point in this, is that it's also imperfect. And in some level reading your book, it was daunting because how do we figure out vehicles, and if you could talk maybe about some of the shortcomings that you've seen in the field. Um, we've seen it in the Black Lives Movement. We've seen it in the resistance movement. We see it in poverty alleviation, that you can't deploy funds as quickly as you really need to. Most of the time in my world, you have to go through program specifics, you have to meet with foundation executives, you have to go through the calendar, and we really need to change that process. And we need to figure out how do we deploy large sums of money. So I guess my question is a couple points. What are the shortcomings? How do we get more families involved? I mean, the families that you're working with are incredible people. I know some of them, and they're doing great work in the world. But we need hundreds of those people. So the shortcomings and how do we get this call to action to get more, more investors and philanthropists to let go of some of their money? Basically, isn't that what we're talking about? And redirect it to people and issues and concerns that matter and are more urgent. Sure. So I think one of the things that's been really exciting in the last decade, impact investment really had to prove itself. Because the other thing you know, that I, I don't want to be at all flippant about is that foundation trustees have a very serious obligation to preserve and grow the assets of their institutions. The same way that if I run a pension fund, I better make sure that there's money available for workers to retire or I need to send my child to college in 15 years, right? So there's certain financial goals that I think are, are completely viable. Um, and that for a long time, there was a lot of uncertainty around, well, if I invest with my values, am I gonna lose my money, right? Like that might be a nice thing for really wealthy people to do, but can everybody really do it? And what's been really fantastic has been that over the past decade, from Deutsche Bank to Harvard Business Review, there's been just study after study showing that you can actually outperform the market um, by using social investment strategies. So one of my favorites from Harvard, um, was that they tracked over 18 years companies that had high sustainability practices and low sustainability practices, both on the social and environmental side. And those higher social and environmentally performing companies had twice the market cap over that 18 year period and 4% productivity gains a year. 
And there's not a lot in society, maybe the computer, right, that's been able to achieve that rapid of a productivity gain and that consistent of a productivity gain. Um, so I think we've, we've now shown that you really don't have to make that trade-off, right, of saying, well, is it my values or my money? It's, no, you can have both. It's okay. Um, and that there's been increasingly across all asset classes from community banks that people can simply move their money over from a mainstream bank to private debt funds that are alternatives to CDs, to um, public markets, right, that there's so many different opportunities that people can do over the internet or at home and um, get to be part of the movement. So I think a big part of it is that we, we had some growing up to do, right? We had to prove to the financial world that we could actually make this work. And now that we're here, right, it's amazing to see how much capital has been moving into impact. Um, so at, a, at the broadest level, when you look at all capital under management, it's actually one in every $5 that has some type of social screen, about $8.7 trillion. And that might just be the sin stocks, like tobacco and alcohol, right, like not a, a deeper impact focus, um, but it's still pretty significant. And then 119 billion that was invested in, in impact investment just last year, according to, to JP Morgan and, and the Global Impact Investor Network. Um, so I think we're seeing a lot more activity. And then the challenges, as you alluded to, is that as something scales, right, as we scale impact investing, we have to make sure that the impact practices scale just as well in the, as the impact. And one of the things that I write about in the book, if people are familiar with microfinance and kind of the history and growth of microfinance, and it, it really is one of the few financial, like social finance uh, sectors that most people on the street will know, right? Because of the, in part, the exceptional work that Kiva did to really socialize the concept. And as microfinance scaled, you started to see a lot of emphasis on building the financial infrastructure, right? Can we make this a banking product like anything else that people can get and that you can get funds of funds and this whole sort of financial system that grew up around it? But the impact didn't always grow quite as fast enough, right? That we didn't pay quite as much attention to what are the right practices to ensure that the impact is made every time. And I feel like impact investment is at a similar uh, crux point that we're scaling rapidly. There's so much opportunity to put so many dollars to work. We've built that infrastructure. Now, how do we make sure that it's going to be real? Um, and a lot of that is about who gets to set the agenda, who has the ability to participate. It can't just be you know, only people who have an MBA. Um, it can't just be people in the global north, right? That there needs to be a much broader um, community of practice and, and a real commitment to accountability, right? So there's a couple core social justice values, things like nothing about us without us, um, that I think the impact investment community really needs to, to learn and build together. Um, so I think the, the thing that gives me a lot of hope is that it's clearly a community that's great at solving challenges, just as we've solved some of the financial challenges. And now we have the opportunity to solve those impact challenges, to really grow impact side of impact investment over the next decade. How do we get more women involved in, the, in being the actors? I, I've spent a lot of time in my career working with women who are running for political office. And what we have found consistently is that they have not had the professional networks or the family networks to underwrite their political aspirations. And so reading your book, it was a same story, right? Different sector, finance, business, um, and I know from women friends in the Bay Area who have started investment funds or the few women I do know that are VCs, um, it's so challenging. It's so challenging. And I didn't, I mean, I, you have some unfortunately painful stories that, <laughs> that uh, of your own experience of, you know, being the only woman in the room, being the only women on panels, you know, navigating all that. I mean, how do you do it? How do you, how do you keep doing it? Well, mostly you do it because it's so much fun. I mean, I think that's the main reaction, right? You have to do things because you love them. Um, and I think that um, you learn to kind of gain confidence and you know what you're doing and why, and people are either going to want to be a part of that or not. Um, so one of the things that I've really loved, you know, the times that I've gone to events and, and I learned uh, pretty young in my career not to wear all black to events because I kept getting asked by men if I could uh, bring them water, um, which, you know, it's a story I've heard all the time um, from friends or people of color as well. 
Um, and at the same time, when someone asks me to bring them water and then I'm the keynote, that's kind of fun, right? Um, it's fun to turn people's expectations around. Um, and I, <laughs> well, in, in uh, Judaism, we call it chutzpah. Um, so, <laughs> in Yiddish. Um, so I, I think with that, yes, there are challenges. And, and as you alluded, one of those main pieces is how do you get your startup capital? And that's, that's true for nonprofits, for for-profits, for any type of industry. Um, and there's this concept called systemic bias, which is the idea of rules that seem really neutral on the surface, right, that never mention race or gender, but are implemented in a way that winds up reinforcing inequalities, right? So, for example, if we say we're only going to fund uh, entrepreneurs who have already run three businesses, or we're only going to fund a fund manager if they've already been around for three years and have invested at least $10 million, that sounds like a neutral rule, but it tends to systematically exclude 90% of the women and people of color trying to... Um, trying to start funds. And I think it's really important, you know, I, I recognize I'm, I'm uh, white, Russian, Greek, Jewish, um, and I'm often asked about being a woman, right? I certainly don't speak for communities of color, but I think that the issues that women and people of color face um, within the investing world are one, very similar and very aligned, and that we really have the opportunity to take on both of those questions simultaneously, as opposed to putting them into to separate boxes. So I wanted to just note of, of why I'm, you know, kind of linking those two topics even in, in questions about being a woman in the field. Thank you. I have one more question, then we can open it up to folks here. Um, I read recently about a new generation of philanthropists, and um, I'm not remembering any of their names right now in the moment. Uh, one I know well in New York. Um, and I, I, I felt a, a different type of urgency around their investing and their philanthropy. And I didn't know if you were feeling that in, as you move through the world and you're meeting with younger investors, um, if you're feeling like they, they get this, that, that they, they resonate with this framework in this pathway, or do you feel that we've also got to bring them along? I think people of all ages coming out of Texas and Florida and the Northern California fires and Puerto Rico, right, that this idea of urgency is being felt in a new way. Um, and I know that there's certainly a, a crop of scientists out there who continue to um, negate the concept of climate change. Um, but I think, you know, even as the, the um, I believe it was the mayor of Miami um, who said, you know, if this isn't climate change, I don't know what is. Um, so I think there's a certain urgency that's being felt by all of society as we recognize climate change as a human problem, not just as an environmental problem, um, and that we actually need to change the way the economy is functioning if we want to do things like have children and feel confident there'll be a world available for them. So I think everyone is starting to feel that urgency. Um, I think you're seeing a lot of movement of young people and then also recognizing the trends around intergenerational wealth transfer to women specifically, right? That the next generation of wealth is, is majority held by women and that's a shift um, that have tended to adopt principles of impact investment much more readily. Um, yeah, that's fantastic to hear, yeah. Absolutely. Well, folks, um, we would love to open it up to anybody who has a question. Yes, sir. Maybe we should pass the mic. Well, I don't know that I need a microphone, but okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, as somebody who's been involved with what I call, because this is what it used to be called, socially responsible uh -huh. investing for a long time, I guess two parts. One is how impact investing is different from what used to be called social responsible investing. And then also one of the problems with social responsible investing is there are a lot of companies that are doing a lot of terrible things at the same time. It's like, for example, McDonald's hires people who might not otherwise be able to get jobs. Um, so how do you deal with those kinds of issues? Sure. So socially responsible investing, thank you for that opportunity to talk a little bit about the history of the field in general. Um, which is that the idea of aligning your money with your values, it actually goes back to the 1600s, right? It goes back to the Quakers um, who didn't want to profit off the slave trade, 
um, so divested from companies that were engaged in, in the slave trade and even went as far as in um, northern New York to start their own maple tapping facilities so that they wouldn't have to use cane sugar from the south. Uh, really fascinating stuff. And it was those religious groups, um, you know, along not, not just Quakers, but Catholics and Methodists and other groups that didn't want to be part of the sin stocks, right, tobacco, firearms, alcohol, pornography. Um, and that practice, then 1800s forward, is what largely evolved into what was SRI, right, which is usually um, public equities, right, so people investing in the stock market um, with an eye towards social environmental values. And it was typically a mixture of screen funds, right, saying that I want to take out the bad stuff that I don't want, um, but then also using vehicles like shareholder resolutions to challenge companies on their actions, right? And that's actually how I got started in the field and one of the stories that I tell in the book about um, filing a shareholder resolution at Lockheed uh, when I was still a college student, getting them to start uh, giving domestic partner benefits. Um, so I think there's been a lot of really powerful work that's been done through SRI. And then going to your question around, well, how do you manage the fact that, quite frankly, if you look at most countries, uh, companies in the Fortune 500, sometimes they feel like countries, um, <laughs> you're going to dislike something that they do. Right, um, and it might be you know Walmart has been fantastic about uh, renewable energy and is terrible to its workers. Um, so how do you deal with that if you're an environment fund, right? And and what people will do is what they call the best in class approach, um, which is that I'm going to take um, the best players within a certain industry. So it might be the fossil fuel companies that at least are doing the most investing in renewable energy. But I'm still going to use shareholder advocacy to try to improve their track record on human rights or on other issues. Um, so that might be something where there have been a number of um, fair hiring campaigns. So encouraging corporations um, to not do background checks or to do them much later in their process, um, given that that's another form of systemic bias, right? If you say that you won't hire people with a prison record, that's a really wonderful way to exclude a lot of young black men. Um, so really looking at how do we use advocacy to improve practices within companies. Um, so, and sorry, then the final piece of your question, what's impact investment versus socially responsible investing? Socially responsible investing was usually, as I mentioned, right, um, more about the stock market, whereas impact investment was saying you can do this with all of the assets, right, from cash to fixed income to public equity to private equity to venture capital, et cetera, right, um, that you can really have 100% of your portfolio aligned as opposed to just the public markets. And then the final piece is that it usually tends to be more focused on proactively investing in the good as opposed to screening out the bad. Um, so that's where hopefully, right, we get to be part of creating the future. And, and the final note I'll say in that is activists, I think there's a point where we get sad of having to fight all the time, right, that there's so much um, that's terrible in the world that we're trying to prevent. Um, and sometimes you want to get to be a lover, right, rather than just the fighter and get to focus on building positive alternatives. And that's where I feel like by screening out the worst stuff but then investing in the good stuff, you get the opportunity to be both fighter and lover um, by doing impact investing. Um, I'm really interested in the payout question, the, the philanthropy. And I've been kind of obsessed with this since Florida, since the hurricane in Florida, mm -hmm. as the obvious you know, marker for climate change. And especially environmental in foundations that deal primarily in environmental work and any other investors that are in that space. I just feel like, what, what, what is it? 10%, 15%, what should the payout be now? Because we are running out of time. So and I think it goes back to, I, I'm more interested in the question of how do I get 100% of that institution's resources working towards their goal all of the time, right? So I could increase the payout from 5% to 10%, but 90% would still be invested in crap. Um, that doesn't work, right? Um, so when you look at institutions like the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation, right, who have been doing a mix of philanthropy and climate advocacy, but then also um, incubating and supporting and funding impact investment strategies within climate, right, then they're able to continue to have a renewable resource that is the, the corpus of the endowment. Because I think that's still, 
um, critical, right, um, that spend down doesn't work for everyone. Um, and that if we can, in that also, at, at, let's presume if we do manage to uh, make the world continue past the climate crisis, that we would want to have some philanthropic resources available. Um, how can we first focus on getting it all moving? Yeah, but I'm so stuck on, excuse me, the payout being about funding into perpetuity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's talk about what perpetuity means today. Right. Come on, seriously. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it goes back to if your starting place was how do I solve this problem as opposed to how do I reach X budget or X goal that's been determined you know, sort of arbitrarily by the IRS, right? If the IRS had said 6%, then everyone would do that, right? Um, so I think there's opportunities for a lot more creativity. Um, and it goes back to... You know, they say in the investment management world, like, no one gets fired for buying General Electric, right? That if you do what everybody else does, then no one's going to get mad at you. And I think similarly for foundations, it's really hard when there's been sort of that groove set of saying it's got to be 5% of, it certainly can't be 4, but no one ever said it couldn't be 10. <laughs> you know, so how do you think about that um, as an institution? I think it winds up being an important conversation to even have. So I, I guess... The final point I'd say on that is, in general, I feel like my approach to impact investment and otherwise isn't about me trying to be really prescriptive on what people should do. It's saying, here's some questions that you should think about, right? Don't just assume that something needs to be a certain way because the IRS said it, right? But what is the opportunity that you might have to be more creative, to leverage more of your resources towards your stated goal? And that might mean a larger payout. It might be more um, connection to impact investment, right? It could mean any number of things, but at least ask the question. Okay. Uh, t taking off from that, I'd like to ask, uh, get back to square one in effect and ask a little more about the strategy and the models. I first got interested in this listening to someone who was working on a water project talking about the fact that it would need to be commodified and made something that that profit-making companies or individuals could invest in. So what is the strategy? Who are the targets? And is it coming mostly from the uh, field end or the, as you were just essentially saying, uh, from the you know, Wall Street end? Mm -hmm. And what, what's the balance right. that, that we should be looking for? Exactly. And I think that's where we do need to be a bit careful, right? If you even look at the word impact, right? Like the Merriam-Webster definition to impinge upon, especially forcefully, right? That doesn't necessarily sound that good. Mm -hmm. um, that it's up to us as imperfect human beings to figure out what impact is um, and how to implement it, right? And who even needs to be at the table to make sure you know. And that means that it can't just be from the 40th floor in Wall Street, right? That it needs to be much closer to the ground. And at the same time, it still needs that financial skill, right? So I think that's the opportunity is to kind of marry those two communities in terms of finance and social justice to come to the right um, opportunities. So for example, um, one of the organizations that we've been close with, they've been working with an indigenous community that wants to do um, their own wind farm, right, where that takes a lot of capital, a lot of technical expertise, um, but is certainly doable, right, and could provide um, a, not only renewable energy uh, for their community, but also this strong economic engine. Uh, moving into the future. So I think there's a lot of really interesting opportunities that kind of marry the, the best of both worlds um, of really thinking about long-term sustainability, which charity doesn't always do as well, right? That in that case, they might do the one-year grant to put the turbine in, but then who's doing the maintenance and what's going to be the model that makes it subsist, right? Um, so that's where having some sound business planning around these projects can really help to make sure the resources are best leveraged and that communities continue to... Um, to, to flourish over time. Um, so there's, there's a ton of other examples in the book in terms of the types of projects that are happening um, and, and happy to talk more about that. I just wanted to say that I really appreciated the thread in the book around natural resources. Mm -hmm. As we have a finite number, you know, we have a finite amount of natural resources. And I think this gets a little bit to Barbara's, Barbara's concern. Um, that when people for many decades have been working from a mindset of urgency, and now we're moving into adaptation, I think, um, are you seeing investors 
I think you mentioned it earlier. Do you think they see that it's a different type of urgency now because of the confluence of uh, these natural disasters, the political environment, um, species? Uh, I mean, it's just it's overwhelming most days um, of, of where to look, you know. Uh, I'm working on a project right now on species extinction, and it's, I mean, I thought I knew about the field. It is, ah, uh, such bad news. So how do you keep the story and the engagement with these donors and investors um, in, in point them in directions that you feel that you can see results or see impact? Because there's so much, you know, I think one of the things I was going to sure. ask you is you wake up tomorrow morning and what do you do? I mean, someone that has, you have so much knowledge and you have so much life experience. And I wish we had, you know, lots and lots of you in the world, but I don't think we do. I'm I mean, it's a pretty incredible mind she has. Don't you know? I mean, it's incredible, really. I would like to give Morgan. There's a lot of us. Certainly. No, I mean, can we give Morgan a <laughs> round of applause? Yeah. It is really phenomenal to hold all that you're holding. So I, I know I just said 14 things in my style, but, you know, I'd love for you to talk about it. And we'll open it up, and I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Yet. Well, I did want to note one of the um, one of the fights I kept getting in with my editor in a, in a kind of fun way was that I kept saying we when I was supposed to say I, right? I was, like, confusing the reader. Um, but I guess I don't feel like there's a lot in this that I could say is an I story. It's, it's always a we, right? There were five co-founders um, in both of the, the um, nonprofits that I started, Responsible Endowments Coalition and then Tonic, um, that it's kind of always been a collective effort and that that's part of what makes people and projects successful, right? So I think one of the challenges sometimes in the culture of entrepreneurship is that there's so much glorification of the sole entrepreneur because we want someone to kind of point to as a leader. Um, and then we've been seeing, you know, in instances like Uber, where clearly that's not working, right? And that um, much more inclusive leadership styles tend to do better at the end what, of the day. What did you call the difference? The one was servant, and I'm not remembering. Servant leaders? Yeah. Can you talk a little about that? I loved the way you framed that. Sure. I think sometimes people talk about leading from behind, um, which is really about listening and then acting. And then I think the other... Um, is about having structures of accountability. Because a lot of what the financial system does is it gives us the opportunity to act with relative impunity, right? That you don't get a lot of challenges to your behavior when you're on that 40th floor in Wall Street. Um, so sometimes you have to create that for yourself, right? And I think that's um, through relationships within the activist community is something that I've tried hard to cultivate. Um, and then it means that I can kind of take that extra check with any investment project I'm doing of, um, is this actually serving the people it's supposed to serve in the way that they want to be served? Um, and the f um, note that I'll make on that as well, you know, there's in terms of what do we do when we get up in the morning, there's three main principles that we try to really embrace in our investment practice um, with Candide Group and then that come out of Transform Finance, the nonprofit. Um, we try to add more value than we extract in any project that we do. So it's one thing to make people a little better off, but it's another to really focus on fairness, right, to make sure that communities are the predominant beneficiary. Um, we try to engage communities in design, governance, and ownership of enterprises, so they're not just the workforce, but are actually the protagonists. Um, and we try to balance risk and return across investors, entrepreneurs, and communities. So those sound very broad, and they are. And the point is that they can apply to any sector, or geography, or type of project of really looking at how do you structure fairness into an investment deal every time. Um, so that, that I really try to hold as my true north. And I think the opportunity with the book was to really um, put that out to community for feedback, right? That's still in that questioning mode of, okay, well, how do I add more value than I extract? And, and can I verify that um, numerically? And what might that look like in different contexts? And you know, how do we make sure we're asking these types of questions consistently? I think that's really been the goal. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yes. Oh, sorry, Laura's got the mic. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the SOCAP uh, conference mm -hmm. last month here in the city, um, one of the conclusions that came up was that in order to spread out this, uh, you know, impact investment, especially from the institutional investment point of view, 
is to have some sort of common language uh, because there's really no way to compare the social impact or environmental impact, mostly the social impact probably, among different investment alternatives. But the other thing that I heard that those days there was also these more activist type of um, presenters. And I love the activists, but I've been an activist myself <laughs> and I still am, you know, when the, the situation merits to do so. But they seem to be saying, we really shouldn't care for that, we should just do it because it's right and it's like saying impact at all costs, even if we cannot measure it. So to what extent you see those two situations as an impediment or as a, actually a need or a risk to... And I, I want to make sure I understand that, so, so both sides are saying, one is people who are saying you need to really measure and name every bit of impact and then the other groups that are saying um, that you just need to, it doesn't matter, just do it. Just to, just to like get it happening. Um, huh, yeah, I think that's, it comes back to that marriage issue, right? Of um, you need people who are focused on the financial innovations and products that'll get it to scale really big, right? So um, TPG recently closed a $2 billion impact investment fund. It was like the largest impact investment fund ever, right? Two billion? Two billion. Mm -hmm. um, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's exciting. It's definitely interesting mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, really thinking through how do you do that at scale and how do you think about it. And what I really love about the team there is that they are so actively engaged in that question, right? Mm -hmm. And I think to some degree, it's maintaining that quality of inquiry in everything we do. Because on the flip side, you also don't want to be, you know, you check the box of how many people got served or, um, but what did serve mean anyway, right? Like, how do you know that's actually making a change in people's lives? And that that does wind up being a qualitative assessment. And what we've really been interested in is, well, then how do you make sure that assessment is happening by affected communities, right? As opposed to us just from the outside saying, oh, here's what we think you should want for your life, right? Um, so, so I think what I appreciate is that we, we need those debates, right? I don't think there's ever a day that people just say, oh, we have found the one definition of social impact. I guess I can retire because it's just going to happen automatically, right? Um, the world is a really dynamic place. So I think the best that we can do is to make sure that we have enough relationship and inquiry to be asking those questions and, and not just sort of stop at what the label might be. Um, but also not stop and say, oh, well, uh, impact, I know it when I see it, right? So I don't need to do the work of actually being accountable to the communities I'm serving. Uh, Morgan, you mentioned the investment into the Native American community that wanted to build, that's going to build the wind farm, which I thought was very inspiring. Can you give us another example of something that is was a really positive and interesting and or very on the edge, something that mm -hmm. is... The next, the next generation of investment uh, areas. Sure, and I'll note that the wind energy example um, is actually indigenous Mexican, so from the state of Oaxaca. Um, but I guess um, one of the investment organizations I really love, which I would actually say is, is reviving a very old concept, um, is called the working world that invests um, exclusively in worker-owned cooperatives. Um, and some of that is helping to expand existing cooperatives. Some of it is converting businesses into cooperatives. And one of the interesting trends that we're starting to see is that a number of elder um, business owners, right, or factory owners, They've been running a family business for 30 years. They're ready to retire. They don't want to sell to some private equity shop that's going to gut the business that they so lovingly built. And that exiting to their workers, right, by converting it to a co-op can be a very tax advantaged way uh, to divest yourself of your business, right? So it's been interesting to see that even separate from kind of a worker's rights approach um, or ownership um, of just being a really good succession plan, um, particularly when you have workers that you've trained, that you trust, that you feel great about. Um, so the working world, it, it actually started in Argentina um, around the time of the peso crisis, um, where a number of factory owners had fled the country with whatever they could put on their backs. Um, and these factories kept operating, um, but didn't have much access to capital as workers came in and turned them into cooperatives. Um, so the working world has funded over 1,000 loans in Argentina with the 98% repayment rate. They then came to the U.S. Um, and have financed a couple dozen cooperatives um, with, with much larger checks um, on the U.S. side. Um, and I, I think what's, what's really critical about that work um, 
is thinking about what actually solves inequality, right? So going back to the, let's start at the big question and then narrow in. Um, so when you look at um, inequality in the US, black men make 80 cents on the dollar to white men. That's terrible. Um, but the bigger issue is that black families have 22 times less assets. So even if you had wage parity, 200 years later, it would barely matter, right? Because you wouldn't have solved that asset gap. So the fact that rather than just creating one business owner, you can create 20 or 30 business owners makes a really big difference um, in terms of that family's safety net and, and access to, to something to pass down to their children. I think we have time for one more, the gentleman here, Laura. Just answered it. It's, uh... <laughs> well, now I'm curious, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so maybe just maybe you could just say a little bit more about sure. about how how an investor can approach um, like asset ownership and the the crazy growing inequality that's like a, a global trend on a lot of levels and, and maybe you know more in the U.S. context or in a, a developed country context. So not not in places where there's extreme poverty in it and there are a lot of things that you could do, but but maybe places where people are, are being squeezed because they find themselves owning less and less and less and people who are owning stuff own more and more. Yeah, and I, I would definitely qualify um, U.S. poverty as extreme poverty, right? It's extremely challenging country and times. Um, and I definitely think funding cooperatives is, is part of that solution. I think the other in the community development space is focusing um, a lot more on quality job creation, right? So we focus a lot on job creation, or when you look at things like a CRA credit for banks, right? So banks are required to invest a certain amount into local communities, and they evaluate success by the number of jobs that were created, which might be, you know, so for example, if it's restaurant work in the US, $2.13 an hour, right? That's the national minimum wage um, for tipped workers in the US, which I think a lot of folks living in California don't know, right? But it's true in, uh, 38 states, I think, is still sits on the books, which is really unbelievable. Um, so the fact that you could get economic development credit uh, for giving someone a job that's two dollars and fourteen cents an hour is pretty unreal, um, and that's one of the policy fights I think we really need to uh, step up on of how those standards get defined. And does a quality job um, just mean that I get a nice uniform, or is it that? I have access to a living wage, to health insurance, the ability to take care of my kids if they get sick, um, and potentially ownership in the business. So I think the other piece that we often forget, you know, sitting in, in the Bay Area, right, for tech businesses, um, the idea of options, right, that you want quality workers to be able to own part of the business is absolutely standard, right? You, as a tech investor, you wouldn't invest in a business if they hadn't set aside the employee option pool, right? Why is that any different from the person who is educating your children or cooking your food or whatever it might be, right? Like why would they be any less motivated um, to want to own um, and, and to want to uh, do a great job because they're actually going to reap the economic benefit of what they're doing, right? So I think there's a lot of opportunities to actually maximize economic benefit, right? Even separate from the social idea of solving inequality, even if you didn't happen to care about that, right? Mm -hmm. You might care, care from a societal, um, optimization perspective, right, financially and otherwise, of what makes people productive and happy and effective citizens. Well, I want to thank everybody. I want to thank Morgan Simon for coming tonight. And thank you, Kat. I want to thank Laura Shepard and the Institute and everyone from the Institute that worked on making tonight happen. I want to thank everybody on our Facebook tonight that watched us live. Um, please buy Morgan Simon's book, Real Impact. You can learn more about Morgan at morgansimon.com. And I think we're going to have some book signing. That's correct. Thank you, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Okay. Thanks again, and join us for our next program.